Today on This Week in Cause, we'll be talking about water, water, water. Who needs it? Where does it come from? And who's blogging about it? Stay tuned. Hi there, welcome to This Week in Cause. I'm Jonathan Harris. As I said, we'll be talking about uh, water. We'll be talking about Blog Action Day, where people from all over the country blogged about water. We'll be talking about Fiji water. And in a little bit, we'll be speaking with Jessica Krell from Our House. It's a grief support uh, service. And she'll be here in just a little bit. And right now, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Christina Gagne. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Um, as Jonathan said, we'll be spending our day talking about water and issues related to water. Um, our headlines today are actually all going to be water focused. Um, we're following Blog Action Day, and so we'd like to thank our sponsor who makes our headlines possible. Storm on Demand is the ultimate cloud hosting solution. It's powerful enough for you to replace your existing servers, so why take up all that office space? Choose Storm on Demand. Thanks, Storm on Demand, for making this show possible. Okay, so on to a uh, Blog Action Day. So. This was a couple days ago, yesterday, the day before, I don't quite remember. On the 15th. The 15th, yeah. which was Friday. Yes. OK, so Blog Action Day, if you don't know about it, um, it's this uh, change.org does it, a bunch of other blogs do it. Every, every year there's a single day um, where bloggers decide they're all going to blog about one specific topic to try and rally uh, energy around it. Uh, and this year the topic was water. Um, so people. Uh, you know, a lot of important blogs did blog about water. The White House blogged about it. Um, and on their website, they have uh, a list, of, a, a complete list of um, people who blogged about water. And there's a lot of different issues uh, with water. A billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. Um, bottled water, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, but the entire idea of blogging about it may not be as uh, it may not be as influential as it was just a few years ago. In fact, I think it's uh, probably not as important since most of you out there, in fact, uh, until last week, I didn't know uh, that Blog Action Day was happening. I knew of it in the past and completely forgot about it. So is blogging dead and is blogging about causes dead? Well, is blogging dead? Um, that's a funny question, considering I just came from a conference called Blog World, which is dedicated to people who you know, are making their living or trying to make their living off of blogging. So no. So no. That's your answer. <laughs> but what I found was interesting was I was there, and I saw no mention of this. And you think that even on Twitter, I mean, I'm active on Twitter. I didn't see a hashtag reflecting this at all. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with organizations that are dedicated to clean water and like water-related you know, topics. I mean, there's many charities that focus on the environment, um, which is obviously intimately related to water and normally an issue that's focused on you know I just I didn't see the buzz about this and I think with something like water it's so simple to understand basic access to water simple to understand I almost think that microblogging tied to offline events would have been a much more effective way to get more people involved and then people that you know didn't doesn't don't have internet access could also have participated yeah I mean I think that microblogging is so much bigger now than normal blogging I mean a few years ago, everyone had a blog, and people would subscribe to each other's blogs. Friend feed came around to try and aggregate all this information. Now I barely post on my blog anymore because I have Twitter and Facebook, and I know my audience doesn't have that much of a um, attention span to where they're going <laughs> to want to read an entire blog post. Maybe you know, is this is it more about blogging or more about the cause? If it's about the cause, you'd think they could just switch it and make it, you know everyone tweet for this cause day or Facebook post about this cause day because those are very successful the yeah. where you put your purse or the what, what was the Facebook thing last week people were like I like it on my desk I like it on the floor yeah whatever. I don't know what that's about, but yeah, I think that has something to do with that, it. That, that, yeah, especially, I mean, microblogging and, and share platforms are yeah. more conducive to memes and things like spreading very quickly. I think virality is sort of what causes hope for. A lot of ca cause campaigns want, you know, the same thing. You can know, see those stupid YouTube videos that millions of people watch. Well, they want the same effect, but with the cause that they're supporting. And so I think there might have been a better way to do this. I think more importantly, I didn't really see, you know, in preparing for the show today, I looked at some of the blogs that, that you know, people participated. I, I don't think that they're treating water 
from a very holistic perspective, like talking about it in a way that one, maybe affects you at home and how water issues are in your neighborhood or like here in the United States, for example, and then talking about the lack of access to water uh, internationally. And so I think that that was sort of a missing gap for me too. Yeah, they're missing, uh, they're missing the point in that, I mean, you're choosing something that has such a, you, everyone has a universal understanding of water. There are so many causes tied to it. I mean, when you think of what's the cause that has to do with water worldwide, you know, you're thinking about how so many people can't, don't have clean drinking water. But here in California, we have water issues. Yeah. And people in, in, you know, all across the country will have a different understanding of what that cause is. So I think they kind of miss the opportunity to pick one thing to kind of rally around. Yeah, I mean, and just to talk, I mean, our headlines, you know, some of them, like, looking through what we're going to talk about, like, you know, we're gonna, we need to talk about water and what the issues that come up with it. I think a lot of people don't know about that. I think one is conservation. I think that's something we can actively do in the United States. I mean, not just in California. We tend to reference California because we live here. But, I mean, even, like, the Florida, Atlanta area, you know, even the New York State area. I mean, all the western states, there are large water problems. You know, everyone accuses California of stealing water, especially in the western states. And so, you know, it's a big issue, and we've built a lot of things out in the West that, you know, probably weren't supposed to be here in the first place. So there's a conservation issue. I think second, then, there's there's access to water and access to clean water. And then third is environmentally responsible ways to, to preserve water. So not just conservation in the sense that you know, I'm not going to, you know, unnecessarily take 80-minute you know, showers or wash my car when I don't need to. But, you know, you mentioned bottled water earlier before the show. So, you know, is it okay to drink bottled water or should you be drinking it out of different receptacles versus buying bottled water? I mean, these are all separate debates that tie into the larger water issue. Right, and so let's talk about the, the big issue, the big cause that I just mentioned uh, a little bit ago. And you hear this number uh, thrown around quite often, and it's anywhere between 800 million and 1.2 billion people in the world who do not have uh, access to clean drinking water. Um, for various reasons, and of course there's organizations, Charity Water is the huge uh, organization over the last a uh, couple years couple that years. is that has yeah. come forth and is drilling wells for people. There are many organizations doing it, um, so that's a big issue. One out of every six people can't turn on their faucet and get water. A lot of people still don't. They use a Brita filter or whatever. But this is this is an issue that kind of goes. It transcends all other issues. Yeah. Every every week we kind of talk about an issue. We're like, well, this issue transcends all other issues. Um, so, uh, you well, know, water is essential. It's essential. I mean, you can't right. get around the need to consume water. And even here in the United States, there's people that you know they're not consuming clean water. I mean, we've seen several instances. I'm sure everyone's familiar with like you know Aaron Brockovich and the whole idea of like the different plants that were contaminating waters. I mean, there's a lot of people here that don't know what they're ingesting in their water. Different things are used to treat it. You know, so think about you know the risk here in the United States, and then just you know triple that, quadruple that. You know, in, in countries in Africa and other places. Right, and the attempt. You know, the big problem is the attempt to quantify this because a billion huge number how are we going to establish to people that there are a billion uh, people who don't have access to clean drinking water and then there are these stats because and I can't even remember which one it is it says every 30 seconds or something a child dies from um, a waterborne illness mm -hmm. um, you know those billion people who don't have access to clean water it's not like they just don't drink water, they're drinking the contaminated water and getting sick because of it. And then you have to deal with, you know, these medical illnesses, dysentery, et cetera. Um, and so everywhere you go, you read these stats, like every 30 seconds this happens, every minute this happens. And we're not really able to quantify it for people. And what I think happens is that when you have a cause that is this pervasive, something that is this hard to deal with, you know, if people read in the newspaper about one person that needs help, they really want to help that person and yeah. get motivated. But when it says one billion people are starving or floods or can't do this, uh, you know, it seems so overwhelming. Like, well, in, in the cause, well, I mean, this is just, you know, it's, it's a neighborhood community thing, even when something happens, you know, close by and you can understand it and you want to help with it. You know, I think malaria is an example of a cause where, you know, the Nets campaign, like, there's a couple nonprofits dedicated to just buying Nets. And, like, you can see, like, resources and reports that say Nets cut down on so many instances. And so people's like, okay, I will buy a Net. 
solved, right. somewhat solved, moving towards something. Water, it's just like, you know, where do I start? Like, I might give money or, you know, and that there's some instances where you can use tab tablets to clean mm -hmm. the water. You know, I, I don't see anyone effectively today really showing like a one-to-one -one correlation. I and, think Charity Water's doing yeah, a pretty good job. They're heading they're, towards that direction. They're getting young people involved and they're showing you know, if if you give this this amount of this is the amount of money it takes to build a well, and building one well will f you help know, X people help yeah. help X number of people. It's still very hard to picture because they say, well, we're building wells in Ghana and Gabon and Cameroon, and you know, to most people in America, those could be you know you could They're throw. Like, a, I'm in Nebraska, okay. You, you could throw <laughs> three darts at a at Africa, yeah. and people you know won't know the difference. Not that people are stupid, but you know they don't know where stuff is in Africa. There's a lot of countries. Okay? Well, another thing I want to bring up, and this is because you mentioned it before the show, but um, bottled water and sort of how bottled water fits into all this. Right. I mean, I think that. Oh, what are all these bottles of water doing here? I know. Doing here? What Look are they doing this. here? We'll be having a water taste test later in the show. Um, yeah. No, I better prepare for that. You better prepare. <laughs> it's going to be rough. But well, yeah, bottled water. Th just the you know the concept of bottled water emerged um, in the early '90s, and it was tied to a fitness craze, and also tied to a there's fluoride being used in water and other unhealthy things in water. So bottled water is a good alternative. It's an on-the-go alternative. There's debate over whether or not this is environmentally savvy, well, safe. I mean, environmentally, it's not savvy. But then there are also the arguments. Well, Fiji will come from a natural spring or na this has natural artesian water, Dasani is just Coca-Cola's tap water and Aquafina's <laughs> Pepsi's tap water. That They say it on there somewhere. So this is kind of ridiculous. This is somewhat ridiculous. This we'll is sugary, to. so for those of you that think vitamin water is great, this, this, is, this is not as great as you might think. It's not. I haven't tried it yet, and but I'm looking what, forward one, to getting it. But one thing I little. do want to point out, because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, is Smart Water, um, which you know I think many of you probably see the Jennifer Aniston ads and the other celebrities that are in the ads. They have the pink ribbon on it, um, and I know that sometimes we talk tongue-in-cheek about you know some of the use of this. Oh, I'll look at my camera. Um, but this is Susan G. Komen for The Cure, so if you buy Smart Water this month, and so you you know, I, I thought this was kind of cool, so I'll just point that out because um, during the month of October, it is breast cancer awareness. Susan month. G. Komen, though, there. I mean, I, I don't know the woman. I'm sure she's delightful, but, but they this are putting. This is better their, than KFC bucket of chicken. It is, but they're putting their name on everything. I can't buy anything without giving. It's like, what if I don't for one day want to give money to breast cancer? Like I, everywhere I go, I'm buying something. They're like, well, Susan G. Komen for the cure. The pink ribbons on everything. Well, I I'm think, not, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's like this specific organization. It's like overload. What am I going to do? But I think everyone can identify and find someone in their family who may have been affected by breast cancer. And we all have yeah, moms no, and sisters and grandmas and cousins. And like, you know, it, it's something that affects a cancer. Something that affects so many people. And so I can see why you'd market on so many products. Not bucket of chicken, but I can see why you would market on so many products. Right. I, you know what? I don't give Smart Water, which is Glasso, which is Coca Cola that much credit for doing it because this is the same company that's marketing this sugary products. Actually, product. three of these are Coca-Cola products except for Fiji. Um, Vitamin water is Coca-Cola as well? Yeah, it is. Oh it's my god! same company as Smart Water. Oh, I should have bought Aquafina to mix it up. To round it out, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to be trying all these various Coke products plus Fiji, Fiji water later. Well, let's jump into our Fiji conversation since we're on the topic of bottled water. Okay. Um, I know that you had brought up some human rights issues in terms of Fiji and sort of how they are. Fiji's water sort of, sort of puts itself out as this like you know natural spring water. A lot of people like Fiji water because it's supposed to be this fresh thing and it's sort of an alternative. Um, but they do have some human rights problems, and they are part of a country that faces water issues themselves. Right. So let me just, and I'm going to read a, a brief bit from a Mother Jones article in a minute. So Fiji water is kind of the would we say the top tier in terms of, of bottled water? water. It's yes. like it's it's replaced Evian now as the top. It's like the Rolls Royce. Of, it's the of Rolls water. Royce. So even like people who drink Fiji are like Evian ghetto. You know they're like that. So uh, you know Fiji is everywhere, and they they have the Fiji Water Foundation, um, which talks about all the good things they're doing in Fiji and around the world. And uh, we've got a quick video from the Fiji Water Foundation uh, that I want everyone to take a look at, please. On January 10th, 2009, the Fiji Islands were hit by torrential rains that caused the worst flooding in modern memory. Power and telephone lines were downed and roads rendered impassable. 
The Fiji Water Foundation, founded in 2007 and committed to helping the people of Fiji, mobilized an immediate emergency response. Within days, we delivered more than 200,000 gallons of water, along with food, supplies, and equipment. But responding to emergencies is only a small part of what the Fiji Water Foundation does. As of November 2009, we've funded and organized more than 87 water projects in 13 of Fiji's 14 provinces. Okay, so in 2009, a writer for Mother Jones went to Fiji, did some uh, exploring, and, and wrote, and I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, from the following paragraph. Nowhere in Fiji Water's glossy marketing materials will you find reference to the typhoid outbreaks that plague Fijians because of the island's faulty water supplies, the corporate entities that Fiji Water has set up in tax havens like the Cayman Islands and Luxembourg, or the fact that its signature bottle is made from Chinese plastic in a diesel-fueled plant and hauled thousands of miles to its eco-conscious consumers. And of course, you won't find mention of the military junta, for which Fiji water is a major, major source of global recognition and legitimacy. So we've got some environmental issues. We got a nice little military junta uh, being helped out there. And the, the beginning of this woman's article actually begins how she's being uh, apprehended by some uh, uh, the Fiji, the Fijian authorities, because they don't like the fact that she's snooping around, even though she's a guest of, yeah. of Fiji water over there. And uh, so, yeah, it's the Rolls Royce of water, but they don't really, they shouldn't get a pass when it comes to all the bottled water criticism, should they? No, I think that there, especially when you're in a small country like that, there is a responsibility, and I think that corporate responsibility has been a big focus of the show in the first 13 episodes. Um, you know, to allow such a water crisis to happen at home and then be shipping off water around the world where, you know, people, a lot of people really do purchase Fiji water because they think it's a better water and they think it's more environmentally conscious. Um, obviously, I, I think, you know, just from the, the article um, that you cited, I mean, the way it's manufactured is actually one of the worst ways to manufacture a product in terms of pollution and the output. And at the very least, it takes the longest to get to us. They have to ship it. Not, I mean, I can't think of a place farther than Fiji. It's literally, like, perhaps as far away as you can go around the world. They have to bottle it, ship it 9,000 miles or so to get here. So it's also just kind of old. Like, to think about it, this water was kind of sitting in a plain compartment for, like, a week. They've also been criticized, actually, for the shape of their bottle. I remember reading an article, it must have been a couple weeks ago, where they were criticized for the shape of the bottle. Um, a lot of water companies, um, because bottled water is a big debate, whether or not people should be purchasing bottles or recycling uh, the bottles that they use. They've been cutting down on the plastic usage. Like, you'll notice Arrowhead bottles well, have, like, changed in design. That's why it uses too much plastic? Yeah, it uses too much plastic as well. So that's been a, a, a complaint about Fiji. But won't it Fiji. contain, I mean, doesn't this contain, this is a liter. This, this is a liter, what is this? This is a quart. 1.8 fluid ounces. So this uses less plastic than this? Well, not saying that this particular company or this brand does, right. but there's been arguments that this Fiji brand versus other plastic. brands. Yeah. Um, I also think that another issue with Fiji that pops up is they are putting themselves out as this very like cause-based um, um, company, and they actually do donate. They donate a lot of their water to charities. Like if you're putting on an event as a nonprofit, they're one of the first companies to like contribute. So, but, you know, so they, d donating water to charity, see, like, don't they just, they have, a, like, a big pipe that goes in the ground and gets the water. Yeah. And they purify it and then they give it out. Yeah. But they own all the water. Yeah. How'd they get to own the water? Someone just, you, so I, I can just buy land, it's like oil? I own all the water I, beneath it? I, well, I mean, in terms of water rights, I'm not sure how water rights work in that particular country, but, you know, in the United States, I mean, there's just there's a history of annexing land and owning certain rights to water, and I won't bore anyone with a water law. We should just play Chinatown <laughs> next week. Exactly. That's what I was going to mention. If anyone's seen the movie Chinatown, that's probably a, a good primer with Jack Nicholson on. Yeah. <laughs> Early water wars, at on least in California. Of water. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, I, I think that what the tra tragedy is here is that, you know, they are in a country where there is a huge water problem. Um, and you know, to manufacture such water that we all think is some of the best water in the world, and then your own people don't have access to clean water, um, that's a major problem. And I think that that's something that you know, should be rectified. I think that if you're in a, I mean, everyone buys Fiji water, so it's a very successful company. Um, not to go back and help to clean up the water, I, I think is a problem. Obviously. Well, I actually bought Fiji water for the first time about uh, an hour ago before I got to the studio, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to trying it. I don't know which one it is yet, but I'm looking forward to having uh, a taste. So let's let's talk about our celeb cause that comes back to water, but th and then we'll talk about 
briefly some organizations and, and things people can do to help out. We've talked about yeah. all these horrible things that are happening and no solution. So we'll get to that. So um, we mentioned Charity Water a little bit earlier. And uh, what Charity Water is doing is they've made their own personal uh, fundraising pages where uh, an individual can go on, just like when you are running a marathon and you say you send everyone a link to your site and say, here, you know, come to my page and donate. So Alyssa Milano is one of the, the big celebrities who's been, who's been pushing this. She gave up so to speak, her 37th birthday and, and told people, instead of giving me gifts, I want you to donate uh, to, to my charity water page. And she the, the, they raised over $92,000. Now, of course, most of the people who donated were not people who were going to be buying her birthday presents. Um, but she did it to encourage other individuals to do it. And I, and I know a lot of people who have and raised, you know, $200, $300, $400 from their friends uh, for these projects. So I don't know. It's a... It's a a celebrity thing. A lot of celebrities are doing it. It's pretty low key. I mean, Alyssa Milano is big uh, on Twitter, social media, yes. doing her good things. You don't see her, um, you know, you don't see her in the PSAs all that often. She's mostly like promoting her own things. So uh, I think she definitely cares about this. Um, I don't know how. Uh, I don't know how many other celebrities are going to do it now that Charity Water is a big, well-known thing, and I don't know. Uh, if it has a lot of longevity, but it seems to have helped so far. I think it helps people to relate back to the cause. We were discussing a little earlier in the show that, you know, we all know water is a problem, but, you know, it, when you're talking about certain countries, you might not have an affiliation or have a real understanding of how bad the issue is in that particular country. I think, you know, tying it back to a celebrity, like if this is your favorite celebrity and this is something they're into, it at least gives you sort of a, a, a stronger tie in terms of, you know, oh, I, I, I want to give them a birthday present. And you know you're not really giving them a birthday present, but at least it's something that you can do that's a little more tangible to give back. Yeah, I mean, and I think, and it's the the website is mycharitywater.org, by the way, um, and it's really easy for anyone to create. I mean, they they have kind of, and we've we've talked about several organizations, including Invisible Children, and some of these other uh, organizations, human rights, and other organizations run by young people who have managed to take the power of the internet and and use it to get out their message, um, and uh, and Charity Water, I think, is is probably doing the most good out of any of those groups. Um, that's not to say anything against the Invisible Children's and the Tom's shoes, shoes of the world, but I believe <laughs> Charity Water uh, really has like built uh, thousands of, of wells by this point. They're raking in the money. I mean, they're probably deciding what to do with it all. Uh, I do kind of wonder how much of their money goes to the administrative uh, costs and, and the cost of making all these videos and putting on all these events and things because they are they're a very Hollywood chic organization right now. Well, I think, like you said, it's very easy to participate, so you can visit mycharitywater.org. Um, and Jonathan, you mentioned a couple other resources and ways for people to get involved. Right, uh, water.org, and then there's also the Water Project, which is Google the Water Project. It's a piece of cake. You don't need me to tell you the URL. Um, all right, so you may notice, and we're going to get to this, and I just want everyone to see that we have this nice setup that we're going to talk about with our guests. So we've got all these uh, bottles of water right here. We have five cups of water right here with these. Yeah, here we go. One, two, three, four, five. So we've got Smart Water, Fiji, Dasani, Vitamin Water, and one of them is the Tap Water here, or maybe it's the filtered, the turn on filter water here at the This Weekend office. So we're going to have our guest in, and then we are going to uh, subject her uh, at the end of the interview to a little bit of water fun. Isn't this fun? <laughs> All right, so our guest today is Jessica Krell. She comes uh, from our house. Um, we've got a quick video to show you about one of their uh, events from last year. Take a look. Now the marathon served as a run for hope for these youngsters each of whom run a mile-long stretch of the race to pay tribute to a parent who has passed away. The kids also wear t-shirts that probably display a picture of the family member whom they've lost. We thought it would be a good thing to give the, the kids in the program an opportunity to make meaning or find something positive in spite of their grief, in spite of the, um, the thing that happened in their life, the death. And so by participating in the marathon, it gives them a way to honor the memory of their parent that died and do it in a very positive way. Our house has been involved with the LA Marathon for 15 years and the turnout gets bigger every year. The counselors at the center believe the race plays an important role in helping a child cope with death. 
believing the kids have a sense their mom or dad is watching over them and proud of them for running. My dad was very athletic and he liked doing lots of athletic things and one of running was one of them. So when I think about it, it really makes me sad, but it makes me happy. If he was still alive, he would have definitely wanted to do this or wanted me to do this and I think he's really glad that we are. Okay, so we are joined today by the Director of Development for Our House. Please uh, welcome everyone out there. Give a big hand to Jessica Krell. Hi. How are you? Thank you for having us. No problem. So give us the, the straight skinny. What's Our House? Give us the pitch. So Our House is a grief support center. It's a non-sectarian, non-sectarian nonprofit, and we provide grief support for children, teens, and adults who've experienced the death of a parent, a family member, a sibling, or a friend. And really the premise behind Our House is that grief is such a taboo subject, and yet it's a very universal thing. It's going to happen to any of us. If it hasn't happened yet, one day it will. And I don't mean to be so, you know, it's negative or sad about it, but really there needs to be a place where people can go when they've experienced the death of someone, especially if it's a premature death. We have kids as young as four years old in our groups. And the groups are about eight to tw 12 people. They last a year to two years and they kind of find support within each other so that, the, so that people don't feel alone. How does the program start? Like, let's say you mentioned a, a four-year-old child. Let's say they've experienced a loss. Right. How, how does it start out? Who brings them in and what, who, who do they meet first? How does it? So what the process is, is it's really all word of mouth. We don't solicit people. If we find out there's a death at a school, for example, we don't call the school and say, hey, we found out there's a death, can we provide our services? We never do that. But what we do is people find out about us. So let's say a young boy's mom or dad dies. The mom or dad might find out about us through their temple, through a friend. They'll call us. We'll set up an intake and make sure that it's a good fit. We try not to have it be where it's the death was a week ago, but where it's like two to three months. And then we put them in a group. And all the groups are age specific and, and death related. So if a kid who's four has experienced the death of a parent, they're not going to be in a group with a kid who's six, 15 or, or 18. So if, so you wait, <coughs> excuse me, you wait a few months. What, what would be the problem if uh, you are introduced to a child after two or three weeks? So the reason is because when it's that close to the death, you really, it's really hard to listen to other people talk about their deaths and their experiences. With kids, I'm sure it's a little different. But that's why you, know, you have your support system for a good month or two months from the death. And then after that, people kind of start to trickle away. And that's when you really feel like you're alone. So really, it's kind of at least uh, two months out. I know children especially have a hard time expressing um, their feelings about death. So what kind of activities do you do with kids in terms of helping them, you know, talk about you know, the grieving process right. and sort of like express their emotions? So what we do is we do art therapy. We do a lot of, you know, kids are very observant, they're very smart, but what's hard for them a lot of times is be able to take what they're feeling and put it into words. So that's what we do. We do, for example, um, grief, kind of your grief soup. And you have all these vegetables and you have a bowl and you, each vegetable represents a different feeling. And you put in the bowl what you're feeling. You'll see that some kids, if they're really, really angry, they'll put more carrots. If they're really sad, they'll put more onions. And it's just a way for them to be able to communicate exactly how they feel. And a lot of times, you know, it's guilt, um, especially since we offer ser our services to inner city communities. It's kids who are now told they're the man of the house and they don't know what that means. And it's such a big role. So we really try to help them communicate exactly how they're feeling. Do you get a lot, are, are there ever uh, children or teenagers especially you work with that give you some resistance? And if so, how do you manage that? Um, there definitely are. As, as someone in development, I actually don't get to partake in any of the group rooms because it is all confidential. But for example, we just had a camp over the summer called Camp Aaron, and we're the Los Angeles branch of this national bereavement camp. And what we do is for kids all over Los Angeles County, kind of like the first 75 that come in and get accepted, completely free of charge, get to come for one weekend to this camp. And um, the resistance that we've seen there are just kids who you can see maybe haven't had any attention back at home. They're really kind of on the, in the background, on the sidelines. They're really rowdy. They're really disruptive. And really, those are the ones that need the most attention. Um, but normally, they're really open to talking about it because they're, they're with other kids who, who understand exactly what they're feeling. 
Uh, focusing on uh, teenagers especially, I know that, you know, in the last couple of weeks there's been a lot of instances online of like, you know, kids committing suicide and like, I think the internet right. really allows kids somewhat express themselves but they also feel more isolated. What kind of programs do you have for teenagers? For teenagers we have similar programs. So we have a few actually. We have one where they can come in group and they come in house. We have two locations, one in West LA and the other one in the San Fernando Valley in the Woodland Hills. And we also have school programs. So what that is, is we go to schools throughout the Los Angeles area and we provide support groups there. So for kids who are teens, who have experienced a death, if they don't have the transportation to come to one of our locations, we go out there and the program's for 10 weeks. And we have kids about eight to 10, again, who meet every week. And that's pretty amazing because they never realize that the person they sat behind in class or the person they sat next to also had a parent die or also had a sibling die. And so that's one of our really important programs that we offer the community. Who runs the the groups? Are they are they psychiatrists? Who what kind They're of people? Volunteers. They're volunteers. We're really run by volunteers. We have over 130 volunteers. They go through rigorous training, um, intense grief training. And they're monitored and supervised by our grief support specialists, our clinicians at our house. We have you know, about four of them. And it's all volunteer run. That's really how we're able to do as much as we do is because we don't pay for staff. We just pay for the supervision of our staff, our core staff, and then we have all these volunteers go out into the community. So what should someone do if they want to become one of these volunteers? They can give us a call. They can come to our website. We have two three-day trainings a year to become an Our House volunteer. There are two kind of options to be a volunteer. You can either do a group in-house, you have to commit yourself to a year to two years, or you can do school program groups, and that's really only committing yourself for 10 weeks. And that's not at the center, it's at schools around Los Angeles. And then, of course, there's we have a lot of events throughout the year, like our Run for Hope, we have a bingo beer and cupcakes, and uh, we have our gala, so where we can always use volunteers as well. Does it cost uh, a lot of money to run our house through the year? Do you rely a lot on uh, individual donations? We do. We um, are kind of 70, 60 to 70 percent run by individual donations, another 15 to 20 percent on foundations, and then about 10 percent, 15 percent on our on our fees for what we charge for groups. So for groups, what it is is it's an average of $30 a group, and we have a sliding scale, so it can be as low as $1. And that's just so that people kind of feel responsible and own that session when they come in for a group. And then it's not just like, oh, I'm just sitting next to this, like, we're all for, it, it, people won't come every single week if it's just free. It kind of shows responsibility. Even though, and, and obviously all these groups are, are personal and confidential, have you met anyone that's really kind of inspired you and, and touched you in your time there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of the board members are really inspiring because they know the difference that they can make philanthropically. And knowing that difference and seeing how tangible your donation can be is very inspiring. And then also we have an amazing executive director who really instills um, kind of inspiration in every single one of us. And that alone is every single day that's really inspiring because you love what you do and you see what you're doing. You see the difference it makes. You know, it's hard with a lot of nonprofits. There's so many in Los Angeles and especially there are a lot of, you know, cancer research, other research. And for that, you won't see it. You won't see a difference until, you know, you're investing in something in 10 and 15 years. But at our house, you give $5, that's five people in one group for a night. Mm -hmm. You get to see that difference right away. Can you tell us a little bit about the gala? Um, it's an annual event from what I understand, so yes. can you let us know where it is and how sure. people can participate? Yeah, absolutely. So we have our gala, it's coming up on Saturday, November 6th. It's our annual fundraiser. And we will be honoring, oh, look at that. <laughs> we will be honoring one Technology. of our volunteers and board of directors, Marcy Foster and her husband, Greg. They're huge supporters of our house. Jean Hybricks is actually the head of school at Harvard Westlake. They've experienced, unfortunately, a lot of deaths this past year. And they've really opened up the topic of grief. And then um, Emily Dubin is one of our, our good volunteers. And she founded the associate board that Judelina's on. So how you can be involved is you can check out our website. You can if you want to volunteer, if you want to attend, and it's a really special evening. So it doesn't seem, you know, th this is an organization that deals with grief, but it doesn't 
seem like you guys walk around like moping all day no, that they stay not uplifting. A, and I have to tell you, I've all, I never thought I would work at the, in an organization such as this because death is scary. It, it's scary for us, for me even now, but it's, um, it's about celebrating life as well. And you see these kids and you see these adults who really have experienced tragedies and they're okay. And so it just makes you feel, feel better about what you do. And do you have any services um, that, you know, if someone wanted to call in, you know, like a hotline or anything that someone can call into, or is it all just in person? We provide resources for people all over the country. So if Great. someone's in Nevada or in, you know, New York, and they're like, I really need someone, they call us and we refer them. So you just go to the website, www.ourhouse-grief.org, and get our number there. And it's 310-473-1511. And, and I'm assuming you are in contact with similar organizations uh, across the country. So if someone does call you from Nevada, you, you know, you're not just leaving them out to dry. Exactly, you know exactly. And there, I mean, it is very rare to have another grief support center. There aren't many out there. If they are, they're very small. But what we can offer them is any counselors we know in the area, any other kind of support groups that we might know of that are really good, and then also camps. There are a lot of kind of grief camps that are out there. Great. Well, thank you so much for you. coming. The website is ourhouse-grief.org. Yes. I got it right? Okay. And you're uh, going to stick around for some, some water I'm tasting? I'm very excited. <laughs> okay. Well, this is very uplifting right here, and I've been looking forward to this all day, so I'm glad you're here. So uh, here's how it works. We've got five glasses of water. Our producer filled it up for us. I have no idea what's in them. Um, Tap water, smart water, Fiji Dasani vitamin water. We're each going to try some, and we've got straws here so that we're not, you know. And then we're going to pass around this envelope, write down what we think each of them is, and then at the end we're going to open it up and apparently blow our minds. Um, all right. How should we do this? Number one? Yes. All right. Straws? <laughs> I'll pass it around. You should try it first. I'll try it first. So I'm going to use the, I'm just going to, okay, hold on to your straw because okay. we don't want to be yeah. wasteful. There you go. <laughs> Okay, yes, yeah, very, very tasty. Okay. It's interesting because this one tastes very pink and fruity, so I might have to go <laughs> with the vitamin water on this one. It, 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 yes, like, don't um, give it away. Don't give well, it away. Well, I'm just saying, in my, from my perception, the color of it is pink. <laughs> and the flavor. I think you're right. And the flavor of it is also kind of pinkish and it has a texture to it as well it's more thick i i feel it's the vitamin water texture so are we all vitamin water are we, are we all together absolutely all okay. right i'm gonna I, I, let's hope we're right i'm gonna write a big v <laughs> can you see that v all right vi, v for vitamin and i like this flavor this is a good flavor this okay. is uh, first flavor okay. so that's one uh all right let me try two and now this is where i'm gonna have to get really Tricky because I don't know what this is. <laughs> ah. Okay, you try. I'm, I'm running it through the palate. I'm, not gonna, I'm glad you have a refined water palate. <laughs> I'm not going to say what it is uh, for now because I don't want to influence your. Okay. Good. Yeah. This is making for remarkable television, by the way. <laughs> Three people <laughs> sipping water, water, not speaking. <laughs> All right, you got it? Yeah. All right. Um, we don't have, you know what? Let's just, eat. I, I'm going to say I think this is smart water. Really? I think it's tap water. You I think, think that's it's the tap, tap water. All right, so we got two for tap. I felt LA tap. I felt the Los you Angeles. You felt a little. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the aqueducts. No. I felt the I, aqueducts going through. All that right, class. so for my vote is smart water. You both say tap on yes. that one. All, all right, right let's go number, for number three. three. Wow, this is so much fun. <laughs> oh, I know what this is. <laughs> he just knows. No, I know what this one is. It's a piece of cake. Yeah. All right, now it's on me. Yeah. Well. Okay. I believe this is Dasani. I think so too. Agreed. Wow, so we got three Dasanis <laughs> right there. Well, let's see if we're right. All right, number four, almost there. Here we go. <gasps> Running through that. No, 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 this is fun. <laughs> he needs a second taste so that he could determine what exactly it is. <laughs> Please don't backwash it <laughs> in the cup. <laughs> we all have to share it. Hmm, I might want to change my envelope to vote. 
Oh, really? Well. Yeah, I think you should. You think this is the smart water? I think this is the smart water. Really? I don't know. I'm thinking. Or is it Fiji? I'm thinking it might be Fiji, actually. You guys want to try it again? Yeah, give it here one more time. <laughs> there you go. We should do like taste o vision. Like, can you, if you can see what's your. All right. Now, we think that's better than number three. I don't, well, I don't know. We, we aren't really ranking which ones we take, which ones we think taste the best. Well, let's get on to number let's five. Let's go on to so number five. Can, uh, all right, all right, I'm going. Do I'm the going. reveal. Okay. So my vote or, um, is I'm going to go for Fiji with number four, and I'm going to go tap water number five. That's what I think. I think I'm going to go Fiji for four, and then I think I we're missing Smart Water. And you're going to go Smart Water five. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm going to do Fiji for four. Okay, so we're all Fiji. Yeah, but I'm going to do Dasani for this. I'm actually going to take my you're number three back. You're switching your I'm vote. switching, and I'm putting Smart Water for number three. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> you're all switching right. your vote. Smart. Okay, so we're going to go the one, two, reveal. three, four, five. Okay, so number one, one. is, we were right, Vitamin Water. What a surprise. <laughs> Hope we have right. an applause. Uh. So that was one. So number two, this is the one you guys both thought was tap. I thought it was smart water, and it is tap, tap. water. Yay. They were correct. <laughs> that was wrong. Number three, uh, we both said Dasani. You said smart water. Survey says Dasani. Dasani. All right. <laughs> now he's waiting for the applause. Number four, we all said Fiji. Yes. I think so. Fiji, which would mean that Christina got five yeah, for you're five. Good at this, Because this would be smart water. There we go. Let's just, yeah. Okay. Five for five on there. And we, well, look. Um, okay, now which one do you think tasted the best? Um, I like smart water, actually. You like the taste I of like the smart Fiji, water? I like Fiji, but I, I drink more smart water, so. I mean, I like the Fiji. I'd never had it before, but, uh, you, but you know what? The tap water is so close for me, I don't see why I would pay for water and not just drink tap water. Well, I hope that this um, is sticky for people in terms of the water crisis. I think today we tried to focus on how water is a large issue. If you want to find out more about water and issues in your area, um, you know, no matter where you live in the United States, you can visit water.org. Change.org has several blogs that talk about water and water issues. We also encourage you to go to Charity Water um, to tackle the worldwide water issue. And we have My Charity Water back up again. This is a great way for you to leverage your birthday uh, to get people involved in the water crisis. Um, also, just, you know, for example, I want to bring back to the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, um, Smart Water, um, and their branding this month uh, for breast cancer awareness. Um, so thank you for joining us. Jessica, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you. Um, we had a great time today, and so stay tuned for Ma This Week in Mad Men coming up next, and thank you for joining us on This Week in Cause. Good night.